Hey everyone, my name's Ben. This is the mini painting page and I know we've all been there just after a payday, a Christmas, a birthday, something like that. We're walking down the high street and our attention gets drawn by those shiny miniatures in the cabinet of the local gaming store. So we go in and after a quick conversation with the man behind the desk, we leave with a lovely shiny new starter set for our chosen game. This case, 40K. This case has 40 odd miniatures within the box. And once we get it home, open it up, we realize that one, the miniatures are not painted, not built, and still on the sprues that they came from the factory in. At that point, it dawns on us that we are going to have to actually build, paint, and get these models ready for before we can even play our first game. And that's where today's challenge comes in. I want to see if I can paint up each of these forces within a 12 hour period each. And we'll be starting with the Space Marines that consists of 11 models. And we want to make the scheme something that is approachable and something that we can replicate on a wider scale while having areas we can push up to make our characters that little bit extra to look at. So let's jump straight in and have a look at the first 11 Marines and if we can get them done in 12 hours. Starting with the Marines, we are going to be working through the instructions. We're going to snip out all of the parts for each model. Working through, I'm going to tackle the captain first and here I am only actually going to partially build the model. The reason for this is this model has a lot of areas that hang off and cover other areas that we would want to get access to to do a nice paint job. Specifically, I'm talking about the scroll work as well as the cape on the back. By using blue tack instead of gluing this model together, it means that we can come back and pull it apart to get access to all of the covered areas. If you don't want to take the time to do this, then don't, just add him in with the rest, make sure he's all glued up nice and tight. However, because this is the main character for the Space Marine Forces, I thought it might be worth spending a little bit more time just to push the level on this particular model. Therefore, I'm going to be leaving it to last as well as making sure that I can pull it apart in sub-assemblies. The reason for leaving it last is if I make any mistakes on the other 10 models, we know how we can either shortcut those areas or just cut them out of the process and avoid making the mistakes on the main character that people are going to be looking at a little bit more. Carrying on, albeit with a slight slip up due to poor knife control, we end up with a fully set of 11 built space marines with all of the mold line removed. We are sitting pretty at around two and a half hours, give or take. With all of the 11 models built, we can remove any unneeded extras. Here, I'm going to be taking off all of the extra sculpted base details, and we can then use that either as a spare in future, but it makes it a lot easier for us to fix all of these models onto custom bases. For the Space Marines, I decided to go with a simplified version of the Ultramarines paint scheme. So going for the blue, but changing all of the white areas for silvers or another color, as well as not doing any of the helmet color variations that you get for either captains, sergeants, or just general veterans. This is something that you can do specifically if you want to, and if you want particular videos on those, how to do white helmets or something similar, let me know down in the comments below. However, this is a quick, easy, and achievable scheme that we want to be able to do and replicate in a quick, speedy manner so that we can get our first couple of games done. That's also why I have left the pauldron markers blue. Obviously, they can be changed to any particular color to represent any company within the chapter that you want. But that is just a nice, clean, consistent coat of one color, so I will leave that to you to do. To start this off, I'm going to grab a nice spray can of Mephiston Red and use that as my base coat. I do hear you saying, Ben, why are you base coating the model in red and not blue? if there is a blue spray available and it's an ultramarine. The reason for this is that I want to use the red to add some quick and easy color variants, as well as help with easy pre-shading and color change later down the line. Once we've got this base coat down, we can move over to the pre-shading and pre-highlighting. I am going to be using an airbrush to achieve this. However, you don't have to use an airbrush. You can recreate the exact same thing with a combination of stippling and dry brushing. What we want to do mainly is decide where the light is going to be coming from. I'm thinking of using the light from a front and back top down position, replicating the overall light impact of the models if they were out in the open. With these areas identified, I can take the white. Uh, I'm using a Liquitex white tink, which has a nice strong pigment, as well as being thin enough to go through the airbrush with minimal thinning. 
and then go through and build up white over the identified areas, potentially over a couple passes, which should give us a nice change from the red base coat up to white where the light would impact the most. Because I'm painting this entire unit and force in one go, I am batch painting, so I'm doing each step individually on each model and working from one to the other. This is quite useful when we're talking about doing things like glazes or building up a zenithal, because by doing this on the first one and working through, by the time you get to the last one, the first one is dry again, and that is the benefit I'm getting from here to speed up my painting. Once we've done the white zenithal highlight, either through airbrush or through stippling, dry brushing, however we are doing it, we then want to come in and glaze the entire model. I'm again going to be using an airbrush for this just to speed the whole process up, but you could do it just by thinning down the blue that we want to use to a glaze consistency and doing one, maybe two passes over the entirety of the model. What this will do is turn the zenithal areas from the top down into a very nice rich blue color and also transition the red undercoat for bits that we haven't particularly covered. And that will bring it up to a nice rich purpley undercoat because of the blue mixing with the red undercoat. This gives us a good transition from the purple undercoat up to the blue highlight without much effort or work being undertaken to get there. If we're happy with the current look of the model and how it is now, we can stop. However, I'm going to take a little bit of time just to push those colors that little bit further. Going back to the white ink and the airbrush that we used earlier, what we want to do is put down another layer of white across the areas that we highlighted with the initial zenithal. Except on this occasion, what we want to do is make those areas narrower and also try to focus on the higher areas of the model. So the shoulders, the top of the armors, the helmet, and potentially the knee areas. Once this is dry, we can take a paintbrush and some of the white ink or white paint that we've been using, go around and edge highlight all of the upper areas of the model with pure white. This should leave us with a model that has a smooth transition from the purple red base coat up to a white that also has a nice crisp clean edge of white. Once this is done, we can go over with another coat of our chosen blue. So in my case, Celestian Blue. This makes the uppermost areas even brighter because we took the time to do those extra edge highlights as well as the second round of Zenithals. We can use the blue glaze as well to hide any areas that we may have gone a little bit too far on with the white and pull back some of those overzealous areas and make them less noticeable. Once we've done that, if we are happy with the state of the armor, we can move over to those smaller and finer details. For all of the other details, what I wanted to do is identify them and then go around with a dark gray color and apply a clean coat across all of these as a new base coat for these areas. Do take the time to make sure that you don't catch any of the armor or anything like that because touching up on the airbrush nature and look can be quite difficult. So what we want to do is just be careful to pick out only the bits that aren't going to be blue or remain blue as they are already. I personally picked out the pipes, the heraldry, the emblems, as I said, anything that won't be blue. It's worth taking some time to make sure we do catch all the areas, but if we do miss anything, we can easily come back with the same color and touch up and fix any missed areas. For the actual details, I have a couple of different methods I wanted to show you. Starting off with the reds, what I did here was target the seals, the eye lenses, some parts of the guns and a couple of other areas. And I applied a reddish brown, I believe it's saddle brown over these areas. Once that's done, we can take a brighter red, a more punchy in your face red, and apply this in a patchy style covering the edges as well as all of the main raised surfaces, leaving that brown in the recesses. Once both of these layers are dry, we can take a nice red wash or a red glaze and slap this all over the red areas. This will help bring out all of those colors into a red hue while keeping a nice variance in the overall tone from that brown to red, but now overall reading as a red, adding nice nuance without any real overall effort. We also have these scrolls affixed by the seals we've just painted. And to do this, we wanted a very quick and simple process, a rough highlight of khaki. This was targeting all of the upper areas and will bring it more in line with a paper tone. 
Then we want to finish off with a highlight of white where we catch essentially just the tips and edges of the paper. It could be fine to leave it here if you want that modern day bleached paper look, that crisp white paper look. However, personally, I want that parchment old time looking paper style. So what I'm going to do is put a nice coat of sepia wash or sepia glaze over all of the parchment just to bring it into this sort of brown tea stained paper looking effect. Moving over to the undersuit after this, which has already been base coated in the gray as a area that is not blue. What I want to do is take a desaturated blue, which gives off a cool white feel once applied over the dark gray that we're using as a base coat. Once we've got this color, we want to highlight all of the ridges, all of the areas that we want to be picked out and look as this gray leather. So this could be some of the pouches. It could also, as I said, be the undersuit. What we then do is apply a dark purple wash over the highlighted areas and the undercoated gray. What this will do is bring it all together in a nice color overall, bringing the gray to a blackish purple and also bringing down the color of the desaturated blue, making it more in line with the rest of the model and paint scheme. This will leave us with a few more areas that still need to be tackled that aren't going to be metallic overall. Mainly I'm looking at the leather pouches and accessories on the model. To tackle these areas, what we're going to do is use the same car key that was used on the scrolls, but this time apply it in a varying amount of stippling and directional strokes. What we're trying to do here is get some variation in line thickness, line length, and also pattern. Feel free to let the first round dry and do a couple of stacked layers on top of each other, because what we're trying to do is create, without a lot of work, a distressed worn leather look. Once we're happy with the strokes we've done, to complete it, we want to do a glossy brown wash. I'm using Canoptic Armour Shade here, but we can get a similar effect from using a normal brown wash or any other brown wash mixed with some gloss varnish. Taking this wash, we cover all of the leather bits, making sure to monitor it slightly and mop up any areas of overspill or pooling. Then once dry, this should bring out the worn leather effect, together also making the area glossy from the gloss wash we've put over to reproduce that distressed shiny leather look. With all of the other areas dry, that brings us on to metallics. Now we've been careful up until this point, obviously to not get paint on areas of the blue armor. The reason being that it's hard to correct areas on airbrushed surfaces without airbrushing again, which is a nightmare if you've already painted other details on the model because you're gonna airbrush those details. It can be a pain. However, we want to spend extra care not to get metallics on any other surfaces because that is a lot harder to remove and essentially fix once any of the metallic flakes have bonded to the model. So it's worth it in the long run just to take that little bit of extra time just to go around and pick out all of the metallic bits with extra care, making sure not to get a little bit overzealous and cover the areas that we don't want the metallic flakes to be just make sure that we avoid putting it down in the wrong place. With all the other areas dry, we can move on to the metallics themselves. And that means grabbing our favorite metallics. I'm going to be using the Robeson Liquid Metal range, and I will start off with the silver overall and go around, pick out any areas that I want to be silver. So in mind here, I'm going for parts of the gun, some of the piping and some of the heraldry that would have been white, but I'll make it silver for ease. Once the silver is done, we can move over to the gold. Here, I'm going to be picking out the chest eagle as well as some of the smaller areas like the skulls and the ammo of the gun. For this, I'm taking the autumn gold paint, which is a darker reddish bronzy gold. Again, just take it slow, steady, work around the model and pick out all the areas that we want to be gold. Once dry, we can take a more brighter traditional gold tone Go round and pick out all of the upward facing areas of just the gold pieces. This will mean that we have a nice overall collection of metallics from the initial silver base coat on the silvers to this dual layer of reddish gold to a more traditional gold on top. Once all of these metal areas are dry, what we want to do is take a sepia wash. I'm using the same one that I used for the scrolls just to help harmonize all of the colors 
and then go over and cover all of the metal areas. I'm targeting both the silver and the gold here. Again, making sure to mop up any overspill or pooling. This will slightly tint the silver into a kind of a ancient -y, worn, antique silver and also bring out some of the richness in the gold tones as well as bringing those two colors together slightly. With all of our metallics as we like them, that brings us to the final element on this unit, or both of these units even, that I haven't finished yet. And that is the head on the sergeant. Overall, that was a mistake. I would have preferred to use a helmeted head, but I got carried away when building the set, ended up using an unhelmeted head, and it's already glued in place. If, like me, you're going for speed of completion on your units, it may be quicker and easier by keeping a helmeted head on the model as opposed to an unhelmeted head. This will reduce some stages and a little bit of time. Rather than go over it twice and bore you, I'm just going to use the similar scheme to what I'm going to use on my captain's head. So stick around and you can see how I did the skin tones on that and you can replicate it on any other models without helmets as you see fit. That is 10 models done and overall these guys took me around 9 to 10 hours, bases included, to get a unit of 10, well 5 Terminators and 5 Infernus Marines painted to a standard I'm happy for the tabletop. That leaves me roughly 2 to 3 hours for the captain which is nice bearing in mind that my target was 12 hours. I feel that that is relatively achievable based on what's taken me so far to do the rest of the unit. If you wanted to push your whole unit a little bit further, you could replicate what I'm just about to do to the captain to the entire unit. However, as the captain's probably the one that's gonna get looked at the most, I thought I will just spend the additional time on that model. But as I said, feel free to replicate it across the entire force if you have the time and inclination to do so. Let's not waste any more time and look at pushing the captain a little bit further. First, I will talk about the armor and we will come back to the cape separately. First for the armor, we are going to follow along, do exactly what we did for the other troops. So that is the red undercoat, white zenithal, blue glaze, white zenithal with edge highlighting and final blue glaze but then we're going to push it a little bit further with some edge highlighting. And we're going to use the same desaturated blue that we used for the under armor sections and the blue leathery styles and take that desaturated blue and go through and edge highlight all of the upper raised and sunlight hitting areas on the model. This will be helpfully guided out by the white highlights that we've done previously. And we just want to go through with this blue and carefully pick out all of the highlights. With that done, we can then go through and essentially redo the whole thing, but this time using a white as opposed to a desaturated blue. Everywhere we've used the desaturated blue to edge highlight, we want to pick about halfway between that and the very edge. So for example, on the little placards at the top, we want to go between halfway where the blue starts and then take that to the edge of the point. That will give us a nice area where the light is reflecting off the most. And if we feel that we've gone a little bit too far, we can always pull it back with some of the contrast paint or blue glaze that we've been using up until this point. With the armor done and the additional edge highlights taken place, we can move on to the other details. And these I'm going to essentially paint exactly as I did before. All of the scrolls, the seals, the gun sections, anything that I want to be red, silver or anything is going to get a dark gray undercoat and then be brought up to the same standard. I am going to leave the quality of the scrolls, the red seals and the under armor at exactly the same quality because these aren't going to get much attention. However, I am going to push some additional highlights on the metallics to get a little bit more shine. I'm going to go and start with the golds. The golds get two additional highlights. The first one being the brighter gold tone that we used initially as the highlight on the gold and we will use this to target all of the upper facing areas such as the edges of the aquila top of icons skulls and also the shoulder pad filigree gold areas this is then followed up with the silver we want to do this in a very very fine area and essentially spot highlight the very edges just to get that final glint reflection of sunlight reflecting off of a metallic object and we should still have the depth gained from the wash that we've done previously, 
getting us up to the point of the other 10 models. This brings us to one of the last parts of the model, which is not the head, it is the cape. When we're painting this, we want to try and make sure that we are catching the paint on the cape in certain stages. What we want to end up with is a cape where has a zenithal has been applied to it, making the raised areas nice and white. But as opposed to the red base coat that has been on everything else, we want to get a blue base coat in the recesses. This is generally easiest done by when we're doing the zenithal, make sure the entire cape is caught. Then when we're doing the blue glaze, come in and get the recesses of the cape with that blue glaze. This will then give us a cape that is blue in the recesses and white on the surface. Once we have that, we can then go through and apply a red wash or glaze. I'm using the crimson wash from Games Workshop. And what this will do is turn the dark blue recesses into a dark purple, kind of the reverse of what we did with the armor itself. And it will then bring the highlighted areas of the robe and the capes billowy sections to a brighter red in a nice gradual sense because of the various zenithal highlights we've done up until this point. If we're happy with the color of the cloak at that point, we can leave it there. However, what I'm going to do is just push the red a little bit more on the upper raised areas by taking a red glaze and just catching all of the raised surfaces, bringing it from a kind of burgundy more up to a brighter red tone. Once you're happy with it, I would suggest just giving it a matte varnish if you want a non-shiny style of cloth or fabric. Whereas if you wanted to go for something along the lines of silk or something like that, you could potentially apply a satin varnish to the cloak. At this stage with the chosen varnish on the cape dry, we can move over, reassemble the model, assuming that we used some assemblies and get on with painting the head and the face. As I did mention, we can use this recipe for the sergeant as well. However, if we wanna save a little bit of time, we can just drop one of the highlights. To start off, we're going to be taking a reddish brown. I'm using the same saddle brown I used for the rest of the scheme throughout this video, and then mix in a small amount of pale pink skin tone. This mix can then be used as a base coat and covering all of the chosen skin areas, followed up once dry with a wash of earth shade or similar tone wash. This will bring out all of the details and recesses sculpted onto the face for us so that we can pick them out nicely. Once that's dry, we can add some highlights in the form of the pale flesh. This is the one that we used, which was mixed with the saddle brown. And using this makes a nice combination between the two. And we can pick out all of the raised details on the face. Then what we can do is a final edge highlight of the flesh tone we've just used, mixed with the khaki color that we've used throughout the paint scheme. And just get the highest points of the model. So here I'm aiming for the tips of the cheek the tops of the nose, and then finishing it off with a final earth shade wash over the face, this time with around a 50-50 ratio of wash and water. Overall, that's then him done. If we wanted, we can do a little bit more work here, go in and dot the eyes very carefully. However, for a general quick paint scheme, I'm going to leave them as they are unpainted, and you can hate me in the comments down below. And with that, our captain is done that little bit higher level than the rest of our force. Naturally, we could paint every single model to this level. It would just take a possibly an extra hour, hour or two on top of what we've done so far. In total, that's 12 hours roughly that it's taken me to get the captain as well as the 10 additional models painted up, which I hope shows that we should be able to over the course of a week or two, an hour a night, couple hours a night, or an incredibly busy weekend, get these models out ready to play our first game. That does rely on our opponents also having models ready to play as well. This box set does come with the opponents, so the Tyranids. And what we're gonna do in another video is go through and do a similar thing there, where we try and get the force painted as quickly as possible to a standard that we are proud to have on the table. So if you'd be interested in doing that, check out this video here. Otherwise, do remember to subscribe so that we can see you next time.